Welcome back, Mavericks. Today we have an exciting guest for those newly minted entrepreneurs. We're going to have a business attorney come on who's going to give us some of the ins and outs of starting a business, buying a business, acquiring a business, um, all of those those fun things. She's a lawyer here in Texas. She's from uh, KBR. So without further ado, let's get uh, Colleen Miggle in here. Hey, Colleen, how are you? That's KCQ. <laughs> Did I mess it up already? Yes. <laughs> But we're having a good time, right? <laughs> yeah, man. I told you those R's. Those mess me up. Um, those acronyms. I'll, I'll go back and, and redo that intro. Um, I'll just keep going. Thank you so much for having me on today. I'm so excited to share some knowledge with everyone and uh, provide some guidance. Yeah, so um, we'll we'll jump right into those questions. Let's let's talk about buying a business. I know the entrepreneur acquisition entrepreneurship is a is a big thing right now. Uh, what do you see as the biggest pitfalls of of people trying to buy businesses right now? Well, right now you don't really want to just jump into a business. You want to do a lot of due diligence. You want to ask all the right questions. And if you've never bought a business before. Um, chances are you really don't know all the different types of questions to ask. I kind of think of it like buying a house. If it's your first time buying your house, chances are uh, if you're a first time home buyer, right, you've got a lot of questions that you should ask, but you don't know that you should ask them. Um, and chances are you go and look to your parents or other um, elders and people who've gone through it before to in order to figure out what questions to ask and things to look out for. So the same thing applies to a business. And when you're buying a business, you want to ask, you know, are there any outstanding liabilities? What kind of loans are there? Is there a PPP loan in place? Because if there are PPP loans in place, you may need an escrow. You, need, you may need um, to provide more cash up front for the purchase price. So you also want to look at all the assets. Um, are all the assets properly listed out? Is anything going to be sneaking out the back door the moment you sign the papers? How do you make sure that you get everything that you're buying? And of course, you don't want to overpay either. Uh, what happens if there's outstanding tax liabilities that you don't know about? Those are attached to the entity. They're not going to go with the seller necessarily. So you want to be careful about um, where the business has been especially in an equity purchase, right? Where you're buying the membership interest or buying the entirety of the stock. Um, if, you, if you are doing an equity purchase, you're getting all the history. So you wanna know where's the company been? Where is it right now? And where is it going? Uh, so those are three big pillars for due diligence that we look at. Um, some people have their CPA come in and look at the financial statements. If you can have the, the seller prepare uh, audited financial statements, it's always great, or CPA prepared financial statements that um, adds a level of certainty to what you're buying. Uh, certainly that's, that's more common the larger the business is, there's more structure in place. But um, on these small businesses, they still carry quite a bit of risk. Um, so whether it's a small business, medium size or large, um, Certainly the amount of due diligence you may do will vary and how deep you go, but you still need to do due diligence. So you, you in there mentioned equity purchase, um, you know, and that's just buying the membership stakes of there. There are other ways to acquire those, those businesses with maybe not having much as those risks and just buying kind of the, the name of the company and the goodwill of the company. What are those look yeah. like? So those are known as asset purchases, and that's where, yeah, you're just buying um, a chunk, right? Just the naming rights, or maybe you just want to buy their equipment, or um, I use a chair as a good example, just buying a chair from someone. That's an asset purchase. You're not buying their whole business. You're just buying their, their office chair. That is a great example. But of course, um, you know, an asset purchase can be something much larger, like a piece of equipment, of a large tractor, backhoe, any kind of piece of equipment that's used in, you know, in the business itself. Um, and of course, um, even on those small purchases, you want something in writing. You want a bill of sale. 
you need to document these things because otherwise someone can come say, well, that's mine. And you can say, well, no, I paid for it. And what documentation do you have to show for it? Right. You really need to make sure that these things are in writing. And uh, I probably sound like a broken record when I say, if you have a deal, get it in writing. I'm not saying you have to have a lengthy contract drawn up. But I am saying you need to have it papered in some form or fashion, whether it's email, whether it's a one pager and it says, right. I'm buying this office chair for 200 bucks, you know, on this date, your cash is paid, paid in full and pay via check. So there's, um, if there's uh, proof and evidence that you've paid for it. So I'm not the biggest fan of checks. But I will say any kind of client that says, oh, I, will pay, I paid cash and then there's a dispute. Well, we don't really have much of a, a track record to follow there to prove up that payment was made. So um, if it's a larger purchase, make sure there is a record of it. OK, um, we talk a lot about, you know, lawyers get a bad rap for you know, always being the, the naysayers. No, you can't do that. No, that's that's not there. Um, what are some, some tips, you know, for these new business owners working with an attorney? And, and to go back to the original question, when should you kind of approach a business attorney to in the acquisition process at the very beginning when you found a deal? Kind of talk, talk to give some tips and tricks to that. Are starting to get serious about a business and say, I really want to do this. That's the time where you want to get an attorney involved, right? Before you even have drawn up a formal offer. So what an attorney can do is provide a letter of intent and draw that up that indicates all of the deal points, all the terms and conditions, and also start asking and prodding and poking holes at the deal and, and really, we're, we're asking a lot of questions because we're trying to force you to address certain aspects of the purchase, right? That you may or may not have already considered, either on the buyer or the seller side. A lot of the post-closing disputes that I see are because the parties were not comprehensive, either on the very front end or as they were going through the purchase and sale process. They were just ready to have a sale close and have a check in hand. And they were, um, in some cases, they were in a rush. Maybe their positioning wasn't very good. They were desperate and they don't address something as large as a lease. They forgot the, they forgot the business has a lease, that it has a guarantor listed on it. It's a personal guarantor. Uh, it hasn't been switched over. You know, there's many um, aspects that, maybe someone's glossing over or they're like, oh, we'll just deal with it later or we'll just deal with it post-closing. Well, the moment that, that the parties sign on the dotted line, all of that leverage goes out the window, especially for the buyer. All of that leverage just flies away, gets thrown in a dump truck and drives all across the other side of town, right? Yeah, never to be seen again. Get another party to come into the room and be willing to provide concessions after a sale has occurred, unless we're approaching the level of fraud, it's it can be very difficult for someone to want to come back to the table. So get what you figure out what you want and get what you want from the beginning. And the way you do that is you bring in an attorney because we're going to, we don't just have oh, a checklist that says, have you looked about, you know, looked at the IP or did you have a list of all the assets? You, it's, it's more to it than that. We're trying to protect your interest and make sure that you're not about to do something stupid that you're going to regret the day after closing. Because um, I get sent cases all over the state where maybe it's, maybe they had an attorney, maybe they didn't, maybe one party had an attorney and the other didn't, whatever, right? And the day after closing or within 90 days of closing, there are just a ton of post-close issues that now need to be resolved in a settlement. Yeah. So, or litigation. I try to stay away from litigation, but it does in fact happen. It's very unfortunate. And most of the time when a, a purchase or sale of a business is happening, 
it's supposed to be a happy moment, right? Maybe someone is exiting, they're retiring, they want to spend more time with their grandkids and someone is entering into a business and they're happy and they're optimistic and they want to see a lot of upside in their business. Like this is supposed to be a happy occasion. And if you don't do all your due diligence, what it, come, it can become a, is a real nightmare, a money pit, just like a house, right? Is if you go buy a house and it's got mold in it and you never did any mold tests, you never brought in an inspector, you never got a termite inspection, and then suddenly it needs just a ton of repairs, well, then you've got yourself a money pit um, and trying to get the seller to come back to the table and and say, well, it was obvious, didn't you know? And I'm not discounting the price. I've already discounted the price. And suddenly the parties are having a not so great time post-closing. So I consider it a success when I handle a transaction and I'm, com I'm very comprehensive, but I've handled the transaction. And when we're doing post-close, the post-close issues are extremely minimal. You can't get by and have zero. I would say zero is a very unrealistic expectation. There's always going to be something that pops up post-closing that maybe the parties didn't consider, or even the attorneys or the business broker or investment banker. It's, it's impossible to predict everything. But for someone who does it on a regular basis, I know where to look for the most common issues that pop up. And I also know where the you know, not so common issues pop up, the ones that are not so obvious, but can cause a ton of problems. Yeah. And I mean, you know, in our conversations that we've had in, in the past, you know, it's, you've always provided insight as to just, hey, did you think about this? What are you thinking about this? And it just gives you that um, objective reasoning um, there that I think most people don't realize and, and have that, that counsel with. So I, I'm a big opponent proponent there we go of attorneys um so y'all have no skin in the game so we're just looking out for our client's best interest in that moment and um yeah it's it's even if you don't have an attorney get someone who does no skin in the game i'm not I'm, we're talking no investment banker no business broker right they have something to gain mm -hmm. i always joke about realtors having something to gain when they're showing houses they always look at all the, the high points of the house and they don't point out all the smudges of whatever on the wall. <laughs> right. Absolutely. There has a commission at stake. So they want a sale to occur. And when there is, um, you know, a problem in a home purchase, that is where people get really frustrated with realtors. I'm not poo pooing on realtors because poop, you know, realtors earn their money, especially in this market. They're having to really hustle to find inventory. So I'm not, I'm not trying to poo-poo realtors, but what I am trying to say is sometimes it puts a client at odds with the person who's supposed to represent them when not, um, that person has a commission at stake. Yeah, y'all get to act as like a fiduciary in, in a lot of respects to, to that. Um, so let's let's transition and talk about holding, you know, uh, companies and not necessarily holding as in special purpose, but just how you're going to do it. Are you going to do LLC, S Corp, C Corp? Um, what are your thoughts on those those type and what do you see as the better one? Again, she's not your attorney, so you should go find an attorney um, and get <laughs> legal advice, but. Yeah, so my go-to is the LLC, and that's just because it's so flexible. Um, corporations tend to be a bit more rigid, very formal, require annual meetings. Um, there's pros and cons to each entity type. I will say there's one that I like to stay away from, and that's sole proprietorship. And I get this call on a probably every couple of months, a business owner they call me up and they say, you know, I started out and then I filed a DBA and they think that they have some sort of liability protection because they have the DBA there. And going down to the county and getting the DBA does not provide limited liability protection. The only thing that provides limited liability protection is if you go down to the Secretary of State's office and file for an entity, whether you're incorporating or whether you're forming you know, an LLC or a limited partnership or what have you, 
you're just not going to get that limited liability protection without making those additional filings. A DVA, and this is just a very common mistake that I run across, is someone thinks that, and they're they're misled by this, and of course the county doesn't provide legal advice when someone's going and getting a DBA, um, but the, the DBA is not that does not provide limited liability protection. It provides zero protection whatsoever. It just permits that you operate under a different name than your personal name. So I prefer to stay away from sole proprietorships. I understand people start out and maybe they're starting out of their garage and they don't want to dump a lot of money into you know, forming an entity when they're not so sure that this is going to take off. But as soon as it can be afforded to do so, uh, the business owner should and really must to ensure protection get a, a formation of some kind with the Secretary of State. So I, I hopefully that answers your question, but that is a big mistake that I see and it's not uncommon and people are genuinely walking around out there thinking that they are protected and they are just not. Yeah, I've given a lot of counsel as to that people, you know, if, if you don't have the money to to either form it with yourself with the Secretary of State, or have a, an attorney do it, do you really have business to anyways, like, are, are you ready to be in business? So um, I think, you know, that's a big startup cost, you just got to go ahead and get that it, protection. It really takes money to make money, you got to put capital to work. And um, I think it's a very, it's a individual decision <laughs> and the timing you know may not be right for someone but I, I hopefully that this podcast reminds someone that if it's been on their to-do list they need to make it a priority yeah i i would agree and i let's kind of take this one step further and a lot of things that you sign always have a, a personal guarantee even if you have your own llc um how can you get around some of those, you know, personal liabilities inside your own LLC with that? What is your advice on that? Can you talk about, right, you're talking about like a lease? Well, yeah, so you sign a lease, or, you know, one of your vendors says, yeah, we're going to give you terms, but we're going to make you sign a personal guarantee, you know, as well. So, um, you know, as an attorney, I find nearly every document negotiable, even documents that have come to me that have come from a bank, a bank will still negotiate. I know some banker out there is probably going to be like, why are you telling people that these documents are negotiable? But truly, if you approach the world as everything is negotiable, you will be better off for it. Um, and you should include an attorney in the conversation because you're going to get further uh, by having them at, at the table negotiating on your behalf, whether it's just, you know, better grace periods. Maybe I can't get you out from underneath the guarantee obligation um, from the get-go, but I can certainly ask. It's never hard. It, you should never not ask. <laughs> right. You should really try to say, can I can I get this lease without a personal guarantor and see what they say? Because obviously, if they if you just ask them what they want, they're gonna give you the demands of what they want, mm -hmm. and if they truly want you as a tenant. They're gonna work with you, especially if you're a well qualified tenant. So that's what I would say is. Um, you know, approach everything as negotiable. There is some form or fashion a way forward and you can get out from certain obligations that would otherwise be personal. Yeah, I think that's the, the big thing is just go in there with negotiation. Um, I cross out pretty much every personal guarantee, you know, that my vendors makes because again, those are all written by their lawyers to protect them. And, you know, that's why you exist is on the other side is to protect people from their their list as well so it's good to have yeah, but, you know it's it's quite um i'm only gonna i guess i'm gonna say it as an american culture thing is when we're presented with uh documents that a lot of people just sign them you know they just get a piece of paper that's put in front of them they don't even read it they just sign it and i really encourage people to um have the wherewithal to say you know what, I want to take this piece of paper home. I want to read it. I want to review it. I want my attorney to review it. Uh, 
obviously, you know, the, the dollar amount of the contract matters. The, the higher the dollar amount, the more I can justify my existence mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and really make a difference, right? If it's a hundred dollars contract and I'm $375 an hour, well, I'll tell you, you know, just maybe just go sign it. It's not really worth me getting involved or I'll take a 15 minute glance at it and say thumbs up or thumbs down. Um, I've got some clients who they won't sign any even small slip of paper without running it by me. And then I've got other clients who say, I just want you to work on, you know, the big material contracts that we have and anything that's immaterial, we're just going to, you know, they're going to negotiate it on their own. They're still negotiating, but they have you know, opted to, to um, say that it's just the dollar doesn't make a lot of sense. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's fine. Yeah, and that's the thing. The key thing there is to negotiate. You just got to, the American culture is not very good at negotiating and it's just an everyday occurrence around in the world. And um, in fact, I think some cultures view it as an offense when you don't negotiate with them. So, um, it just, yeah, it, well, you know, we live in Fort Bend County and so we're in the, one of the most diverse counties uh, what, in the state and the nation. And so it's, it's, um, if you start negotiating with someone, it's probably in this county in particular, isn't so unusual or it's not offensive, but there's other parts of the country you start going and well, will you take, you know, X dollars instead of Y dollars? And they're like, well, this is the price, you know, mm-hmm. this is what I've listed for. It's not like you go in the grocery store and start negotiating, but uh, there's certainly people who do, who say, oh, this food is rotting. I won't, I don't want to pay full price. And they go up to the manager and they, they negotiate their fruit. Mm. <laughs> I know to some people that sounds very bizarre, but it's absolutely something that happens. When I was young, I worked at a, you know, Kroger's and Randall's and people came and negotiated all the time. And I, it, it's not my money. Like just you know, go talk to the produce manager and here you go. Um, but yeah, so it's, it's a good thing. So let's, what would you say is, you know, some advice for people moving from that corporate to the small business world, especially in the post COVID world. Right. Well, number one, we already talked about the negotiation. You got to get used to negotiating. Um, but also you get to create your own world. You get to create your own environment and things don't have to be done the way that it was done in your corporate environment. You get to create your own, um, business, your own culture, you get to make all of the decisions and you'll start understanding, especially if you weren't in a management role prior to being owning a business, you're really going to see things from that manager perspective, or if you haven't already been seeing them, you're going to start seeing them and, and figuring out that there are such things as overhead and you want to minimize them and you don't want to go, you know, all in all at once. You really want to start easing in things. You want to test markets. You want to gather information and data. And when it comes time to hiring and firing employees, it's best if you have a handbook and it's best if, you know, (laughs) some people even bring me in to fire their employees. Uh, Sad to say, I have had to fire uh, one or more employees before for some clients and um, I got some horror stories for you. <laughs> but, uh, but generally speaking, there is liability everywhere you turn. And that's the scariest thing is when you're in a corporate environment, so many of these things are already being taken care of and they are put in a structured environment and suddenly when you're owning your own business it's a very unstructured environment so treat the owning of a small business just like you would you know a a nine to five job or even more so right get up in the morning and go straight to your computer and maybe don't stop working until 9 p.m i tell my small business clients especially the startups that the first 18 months is pretty much hell you're going to be working a lot. You're going to be hustling out there. And that is normal. That is normal for the first 18 months. Um, and I, you know, if I see someone who's coming to me and they don't appear to be fully committed to a lifetime of, <laughs> or at least 18 months of, of really, really hard work to get their business off the ground, then I, I really try to stop them and say, are you sure you're ready to make this commitment or, 
um, what is your plan going forward to transition out and and move into, you know, this is a full time role, because certainly some people start a side hustle and they still have their full time job and then something gets really, really busy at work and then their side hustle just falls off the face of the earth. And if you've got a seasonal side hustle, that may be OK, because, right, maybe you only sell goods around mm -hmm. Christmas or the holidays and you can spend the rest of the year focusing on your day job. But uh, for, for most people who are trying to get a real, real business off the ground, that first 18 months, it's a it's a full time job. It's actually more than a full time job to get that business off the ground, get your name out there and getting your product or service out there and gaining enough, you know, Google reviews and um, feedback from clients and customers. And, and you, you just name it to get all the systems in place or even hiring your first employee or contractor. So and we're going to, you know, touch on that in some other episodes, but kind of what are some quick caveats to um, the distinction between employee and a 1099 contractor that you see some people mess up on? Yes. So the IRS, a lot of people are, you know, they want to flip flop between making someone an employee or a contractor. And indeed, there's a lot of gray area in there. And the, the, um, determination as to whether someone is an employee or a contractor, there are um, points to consider from the IRS that have been published. And that's something to look at. Just as a resource, I'm going to point someone in that direction. But also, um, an employee is someone that you're directing them how to do the work, and you're providing them all of the equipment to do the job, right? So, Let's say I have an associate attorney. I'm providing him a laptop and monitors and a mouse, and I'm telling him exactly how to do it. Um, and I'm, I'm telling him he has to be here between eight and five. His butt must be in the chair. And I'm directing uh, nearly all of his activities. But a contractor is someone who may have their own equipment, like their own laptop. Maybe they come and go from the work site or the premises. Um, they make their own hours and schedule. Maybe you're providing some guidance um, as to what you want generally, but you're not telling them exactly how to do the job. And those are some really big distinctions. And I see a lot of folks try to um, classify someone as a contractor when it's really an employee. And I will say if if you're going to struggle or you have someone who's borderline, seek an attorney to help you make that determination. But also once you stick, once you pick one avenue, I would say stick with it. It looks really bad to start flip flopping and having one person who do that job as a contractor and then the next person is an employee or vice versa. I think right. flip flopping is not good. <laughs> yeah. It looks worse because then it seems like maybe you knew that the person should be an employee when you were classifying them as a contractor. And there are penalties associated with misclassification. So I encourage someone to make that classification correct from the get go. But there are people where they intend on having them as a 1099 and then they actually grow into being an employee. And those are the folks who, you know, maybe they started out working 10 hours a week and then suddenly they were working 40 plus hours a week or the relationship changed. And that's the hard thing about the law and all these factors mm -hmm. tests is um, the answer can actually change based on the facts changing. Right. This is very fact specific. So be careful of anything that is changing. And in fact, I say that anything I say that about contracts, I say that about wills. Um, anytime that there's been a major change, you need to revisit those documents because chances are they're not reflecting what is happening right now. They may have been reflecting what the deal was in that moment, but they may not re-reflecting re the, the reality of the situation at this point in time. Yeah. So, so last question, what do you, you know, recommend people do to get kind of get their house in order to, to go start a business and, and then come and approach you and get all those documents set up? So first things first, you have to have a name, 
for your business. I have a lot of people come to me and they say, I want to go form this entity or I really want to start a business. And they don't even know what to name their business. So uh, and it can take weeks for them to come back to me with a name. And then we've got to go get that cleared through the Secretary of State. So I'll say first things first is the name. Mm. <laughs> that sounds so simple, but it, it's a it's a real tripping hazard for some folks. Um, but, but also come in mind, you know, if you're going to go into an attorney's office, we're not expecting you to know everything. So if you have a list of questions that you want to ask, please, please ask them. We'd rather answer them uh, from the get-go because if you have certain concerns, we may choose a different entity for you. Um, as I said, the LLC is my, my general favorite. I think it provides the most flexibility, but there can be considerations from a tax perspective or even a structuring perspective where um, I may say that a, a, a limited partnership needs to be put in place or even a corporation. And of course, we're expecting tax rates to increase now. So um, everybody, CPAs, financial advisors, attorneys, we're all bracing ourselves for more change here as if Obamacare wasn't already a lot of change um, the last number of years, the, the tax implications of having all of these stimulus checks sent out is that the government is going to need to find more sources of revenue. And I think the current um, concern is that they're going to lower the estate tax thresholds back to the way that it was before. And I think it sits right now at somewhere between 10 and 11 million um, I haven't checked as you know lately. I don't run into too many clients that get to that that threshold. So I check on it every time I, I really need to. But if they go back to the way that it was before, I think that was at 5.5 million, and that's going to include a significantly more um, Americans in that, and they're going to have to pay tax on the way on the way out. <laughs> so if there was ever a time to really be looking at Roth IRAs, I, I couldn't, uh, I, you know, <laughs> so really the time to be reevaluating your financial situation and, and potentially bracing for higher tax rates, either on the business side or the individual side and trying to plan for, um, for those increased rates, which even myself, I'm, I'm thinking about what am I going to do? Because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm a professional. My husband's a professional. We have no children. We're just going to get absolutely killed. <laughs> yeah, I have three <laughs> anyway, for that reason. We're, we're lacking in additional deductions. So yeah, um, if there's ever a time to go ahead and have a kid, you know, you need that additional deduction, mm -hmm. go magically have another kid so you can, I'm not saying don't put a fake kid on your tax return. That's not, right. <laughs> that's not what I'm saying. <laughs> Twist my words. But if there was ever a time to try to maximize your deductions, oh my gosh, then the coming years, it's definitely, yeah. we're, we're going to be, um, we're going to feel like we're living in Europe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have three kids. So that, that I get quite a few tax deductions from, from that, but they still cost more than the tax deductions. So it may not be worth it. <laughs> You know what? Well, you got a, you, you probably get a stimulus payment that included the kids as, as part of your family. So, and <laughs> what what time? Here's your one time. I, I spend about ten ten thousand dollars a year in childcare. So, um, oh my it's it's not a cheap endeavor. Um, well, Colleen, thanks so much for for coming on. Um, why don't you tell everybody how they get a hold of you? Um, you're licensed in just the state of Texas, right? I'm licensed in the state of Texas in the District of Columbia, but a majority of my clients are located right here in Houston. Uh, I practice all over the state for the purchase and sale of businesses like in San Antonio, Austin, or even Dallas. Um, try not to stay, you know, get out of uh, West Texas, but I did go to Texas Tech and I uh, have a sweet spot for West Texas there. But if you need to reach me, my phone number is 713-828-2783. And my email address is cmigl at kcq-lawfirm.com. Yeah, we'll, we'll put that in the show notes too, because um, so, so people reference. Um, any, any parting words? 
Get it in writing. <laughs> Get it in writing. That's right. You heard it there. Uh, well, again, thanks, Colleen, so much for for talking to us, and and we'll put those in the show notes and. Uh, Get a hold of your business attorney. If it's not Colleen, find somebody else because they will save your hide more than you can imagine. A good business attorney is worth their weight in gold. Absolutely. Okay, folks, we'll see you next time.